My name is Baptiste and I'm from the Free Busy Project. We often meet together to share our thoughts and vision about what's going to be the next big thing in IT um, or have a long philosophical discussion about technology in general. That's how we predicted that the cloud would be a thing before it was, the world was even invented. Uh, absolutely. Anyway, uh, I think it was around 5 p.m. Uh, beautiful afternoon. Um, yeah, okay. Who are we kidding there? Yeah, it was more something like 2 in the morning. Yeah, we're probably into some random bar having our empty glass of uh, red uh, Californian Zinfandel. No, 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 Burgundy, Burgundy. Uh, we're in France. You can't say you're drinking that thing. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so, Burgundy. It was Burgundy. Um, so, I started complaining that the Burgundy did not taste it. Oh, so if not taste, we, again, we're in France. We were having a Burgundy, a uh, uh, Californian one in that case. Whatever. So, as I was saying, the wine didn't have any flavor in it. And that's when it hit me. Oh my god, this is actually that previous day. You guys suck. You guys don't have flavor. <laughs> Okay, so what is flavor? Uh, flavor is a uh, very interesting concept. Uh, I'm not aware of any other package manager in Unix land that implements the same functionality. Uh, basically, it allows providing packages combined with a different set of options. So that's obviously very convenient from a dependency point of view. Uh, since according to the option that you set for the compilation, the final binary will change as you might end up uh, linking to different libraries, obviously. So since you want to be uh, in control, um, but providing packages compiled with a good set of options is quite complex, while sometimes it's next to impossible to have a, like, a good default, because it's a hard compromise, and that's where the flavor kicks in. For example, you can install SendL with or without uh, SASL support, or with or without LDAP support, uh, etc. It's completely different from uh, what we call sub packages, which are just split packages. Um, these are typically used when you have a software uh, that comes with a huge amount of data, for example, like audio or graphics or uh, games packages. And these rarely change, while the main binary does change each time it is updated. So instead of having a huge packet that bundles a complete set, you just uh, update one small uh, sub package. It can also be used for things that uh, ship modules or add uh, components um, that have a lot of different dependencies. PHP is a good example of that. Um, on OpenBSD, for example, we compile it with uh, pretty much all the possible options. So the build requirements are big, but the port only needs to be built once, and since the package itself is then split into several sub-packages, you only get to install, to install what you read in a PHP IMAP or PHP MySQL, etc. With that, last, with that last one, uh, you really took the, red ex the, the wrong example. On FreeBSD, we have fine-grained split uh, package for PHP. So if you want PHP within, with IMAP, you just install PHP 5-IMAP. Yeah, but my point is that actually sub-packages allows you not to have to deal with fine-grained packages. If I understand correctly how your port tree works, you still need to build each PHP modules one by one while we do it everything at once. Yeah, you're correct there. Um, there are not really sub-packages, and it would be nicer if we had them. If you're speaking about flavors, a good example would be probably uh, open and app uh, client compiled with or without SASL support. Right, so if I need SASL support in OpenLDAP on FreeBSD, I assume that I need to build it myself, right? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. But my fear is what will happen when I suddenly run package of date and package of grade? 
Yeah, probably bad things, like removing half of your packages. Nice. So, yes, yeah. it's true that uh, we do not have the flavors nor the packages. Uh, but there are a lot of ongoing works. Actually, uh, flavors should be uh, committed in the next hours, days. Uh, we talked about it yesterday. Um, so the thing is, uh, that work is uh, pretty hard as it, it breaks the design um, of the way some tools that are heavily used by some user uh, works. Uh, for example, Port Master and Port Upgrade. Um, and those tools are not right now barely uh, maintained. So as soon as we make such modification, we have no one to update those. Um, so on FreeBSD in general, we'll try how to have an upgrade path for users to try to avoid uh, breaking things. Uh, keep in mind that um, we do not release a package set, but the post three is a rolling release, not tied to a given release, so such change will um, need to be smooth when it arrives. Which reminds me, uh, you guys do not support upgrading packages on a given release, do you? Actually, we do support upgrading packages on a given release. What we do not provide are the actual binary packages. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, it's true that you need some kind of a build box or something uh, where you can distribute packages uh, update from. Uh, but there is work in progress in this area and we should be able, hopefully, to be able to provide uh, updated binary packages in the next year or so, famous last words. Uh, so we just need to agree on the workflow, the team responsible for it and uh, get the required infrastructure, etc. It's, it's not a technical problem, it's not a more of a workflow problem. Um, but talking about package app, um, it's important to note that on OpenBSD, a lot of operations are done as completely different and privileged users. So you have different users for fetching, extracting, installing, uh, checking the signatures, etc. We, for example, don't really want to go uh, on the internet as root or anything. Um, while I think you guys still do not drop privileges when using the fetch with a package. Can well, you comment about that? Actually, that's not true. Uh, package uses Capsicum to sandbox uh, everywhere it is possible to do to, to make a sandbox, uh, since Capsicum exists basically. And uh, package also uses unprivileged user uh, to fetch package or in every area where we don't need uh, root privileges. So um, while sandboxing support um, is there for a long time, uh, unprivileged user mechanism has been added um, quite recently. But I actually uh, got it in before you did from a few days. Yeah, 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 but the lib fetch commit was reverted. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, back to our topic. We've also tried very hard to provide proper upgrade uh, path for our users, obviously. But the difference uh, is that we don't have to deal with a legacy or a maintained package wrapper that uh, you guys have, like the port master, port upgrade, port super guru, whatever. Um, our package tools are designed to provide everything one needs uh, for package management without the need of any external <laughs> So don't forget, we have a very long tradition of uh, providing proper binary packages over pushing people to actually compile them. Well, that's also true for FreeBSD now. It's been a while now that we are building uh, binary packages. Uh, most of the tool you're speaking about are mostly um, to use the pod 3 directly on the live system uh, rather than using the binary package, uh, which uh, I think is uh, a usage which is not supported by OpenBSD. No, no, no. Okay. Now FreeBSD has first-class citizen and binary packages. It's perfectly supported uh, by OpenBSD. We just don't encourage people to uh, do it because for 99 or 99% of the time, it's just uh, not needed. Yeah. Um, one of the things about uh, the FreeBSD Pulse 3 uh, you need to keep in mind is that it works on all supported version of FreeBSD, which, uh, yes, it reminds me that you only support one version of, Free B of OpenBSD and only for six months. Well, um, you are correct that for packages, we only support the current release, uh, which at this time is 6.1. Uh, operating system, base system itself, is supported for uh, two releases. Uh, and aside from uh, current snapshots, uh, our port 3 is also tagged to a specific release. Uh, that's a design decision. Uh, we don't want to uh, enforce to our user to upgrade to a new major version of a particular software. Um, and we don't want to maintain like four different versions of the same software to prevent that. So, which is why our port 3 does not follow a rolling release model, except for current, obviously. So, but considering the fact that we have regular releases every six months, I mean, our packages don't have the time to get too old anyway. Um, 
Regarding the support policy itself, it's, uh, it's pretty basic. Um, basically, we support the base, uh, the base system for the current release and the previous one. Packages only the current one. As I said, there's ongoing discussion to maybe improve that part. Um, so that's true, that this means that you need to upgrade at least once a year if you want to run a supported uh, open DLT release. I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, I'd rather upgrade often in small steps uh, than uh, once every five years having to uh, deal and handle uh, multiple invasive uh, changes at once. Um, I do understand the need for uh, LTS like releases. Uh, I just don't like it when I'm the one responsible for upgrading. <laughs> So, that's it. Why well, it can be good to have some long-term support? What the fuck is your policy? I mean, <laughs> extended support, <coughs> normal support. I mean, how come free PSD 10.0 was still supported? Well, 10.2 wasn't. I mean, the, this is all very confusing. It makes no sense. And no support can be good if you don't understand how it works. Come on, that's easy. I will read it for you so that you understand. So. We have the normal releases. Um, those are releases which are published from a stable branch, uh, were, support, uh, were supported by a security officer for a minimum of 12 months after the release, and for a sufficient amount of time, uh, if needed, to ensure that a new release for at least uh, is out for at least three months before the older normal release expires. And then you get the extended one. So, selected release, normally uh, every second release uh, plus the last one from each table branch uh, were supported by security officer for a minimum of 24 months after the release and for a sufficient additional time if needed to ensure that there is a newer extended release for the last three months before the older extended release expires. It's easy, no? <laughs> yeah, no, okay. I, I agree, uh, it, it's a mess. Well, actually, I should say it was a mess. Uh, <laughs> Furthermore, it was causing a lot of issues uh, when maintaining the port 3 uh, as we had to wait for at least two years with this model uh, to be able to use some modern tools uh, in the port 3, so it, it, it was kind of a pain. Well, we changed that uh, with uh, FreeBSD 11.0, so uh, now the model is uh, way easier to understand. So. Each major version of a stable branch uh, is explicitly supported for five years. And then uh, we can issue a new dot release whenever we want without extending that date. When we issue one, the, old, the previous one is maintained for only three months, so you have three months to upgrade. So going from 11.1 to 11.2 and then 11.3. So that way, uh, we can benefit the users can benefit uh, stability for five years, and at the same time, they have the new features. Oh, you're finished. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Well, uh, it looks like previous support model keeps newer features out of the hands of users because it can be years before they actually see the new features in the release, right? So maybe it reduces real-world real testing and, well, basically benefits no one. In my opinion, OpenBSD model is super easy to understand and keeps the code stable but still pretty fresh. Whatever is in current at a certain period of time will end up in the release, which would take at the very worst six months. So you, you seem to have misunderstood one of the benefits of the new release model. Uh, new feature, as, as soon as they are not breaking binary compatibility or uh, things like that, are merged to the stable branch. So as soon as we need a new feature, we'll just issue a new release and uh, your problem is solved. So you get new release supporting those new features anyway. Well, you did say that you had to wait for at least two years before being able to use the modern tool available. With the previous model. Ah, oh, previous model, okay. Well, anyway, we do things differently. Uh, we're not afraid of uh, breaking binary compatibility uh, in current and for uh, our upcoming release, uh, obviously. So we don't do like, stuff like merge of uh, backport uh, uh, usually. Uh, but as you put it, your process is kind of less so, yes, I may have misunderstood. So, uh, given we do support binary upgrade, it's very easy on FreeBSD to upgrade from a minor version to another minor version. Uh, by the way, uh, binary upgrades also works very nicely across major releases in FreeBSD. Uh, but hey, I must be using, losing you somewhere here because uh, it's true you do not support binary upgrades, uh, neither for security fixes or across releases. Uh, seriously, it should be very tedious to maintain some open BSD boxes in production. Yeah, I see where you're going here. Uh, the way you put it is not entirely true. 
Um, binary of grade between releases are and have always been perfectly supported. What is not supported are in place of grades uh, of the base system from one release to the other. Uh, but is that really an issue? Uh, I mean, supporting in place major of grade would not prevent us from having to like, remove anyway. So. For me, I think your great process of OpenBSD is just one of the easiest and fastest I've ever encountered. Uh, just reboot on the new release, boot uh, on the uh, BSD around this kernel, uh, and it will do the rest for you in like five minutes. And also, thanks to our auto install and auto upgrade uh, functionality, you can give it the path to an answer file via DHCP, and you won't even need the manual interaction. You can also upgrade your packages to match the new release, uh, and add this to the fact that Sysmerge, uh, the um, current configuration files merger is automatically run on boot. Well, I'm pretty much left with uh, nothing to do manual. Yeah, well, sounds okay-ish, but what happens if you have to uh, upgrade for security patches? Uh, okay, um, until a few months ago, um, updates within a particular release were only provided in the form of CVS patches. Uh, this has changed okay. since the 6.1 release, and the new syspatch utilities, uh, utilities I'm sorry, which is a base system update tool uh, that will basically fetch, uh, verify, and apply uh, binary updates on base system. Uh, it tries to design a bit what our installer does, so it's, uh, it's, it's very simple, secure, uh, fast, and pretty much do it. Well, uh, on the FreeBSD side, uh, we do support, as I said earlier, uh, in-place binary upgrade via the FreeBSD update tool. Um, so the basic behind, uh, design behind FreeBSD update is uh, that we create binary diffs um, of, and we binary patch the system with uh, the changes. So it is very convenient to receive security fixes and very fast for that. Uh, FreeBSD update also allows you to upgrade from uh, one major version to one major release to another major release in place. And the procedure is basically what happened under the hood. Uh, first, it installed a new kernel, uh, then it reboots on the new kernel, uh, then it installed the user and match configuration files and removed the files that are not needed anymore in the new release. And that works. Um, it works fairly nicely for a while now, um, but Fetching all the binary patches when you're upgrading from a major release to another major release can be very, very long. Another issue is that uh, producing the packages is not really, uh, the patches is not really trivial for FreeBSD update as it needs reproducible builds uh, to be effective. That's why we're uh, now looking forward to be able to provide the, a new mechanism based on package itself. To be honest, uh, there is also a drawback uh, about uh, in place upgrades when we need to maintain strong backward compatibility uh, on some kernel interface versus the related user and tools that goes with. Uh, um, a particular case is, is uh, ZFS. It's an interesting thing to look at. So Elimus consider the version in the kernel goes with the version in the user end, um, which is nice. So if they modify the kernel interface, you modify the user and tool that goes with and everything is fine. But on FreeBSD, because you reboot on the new kernel first, then you might end up with uh, user and tools that are not compatible anymore with the kernel you're putting in. So when we are receiving the patches to update ZFS and there is an incompatibility introduced, then uh, we need to make the compatibility scheme ourselves. So. Okay. Yeah, that's, that sounds quite complex. I mean, in place upgrades can be interesting when the upgrade say, uh, takes a while, for example. Uh, in theory, it would prevent like long downtime, but in reality, production should be resilient and services should be redundant. So it's not generally in such of a problem. Also, the release upgrade process on OpenBSD is literally the fastest one I've ever used. Um, if in place upgrade actually meant uh, reloading. Uh, I mean, if you're updating and reloading both the user and, and the kernel without having to reboot them, I'm sure it would have my vote. So that said, about the upgrade pass, an interesting policy that we have on FreeBSD is Polar policy, uh, principle of least astonishment. It's a very strong policy on the FreeBSD saying that uh, we should try very, very hard uh, to make upgrades as seamless as possible and avoid breaking end user boxes as much as possible. Well, in general, we're not really afraid of breaking backward compatibility uh, when we think it makes sense, of course, and uh, help push uh, our ideas forward. Uh, that said, I can 
understand the, uh, the need for Ebola sometimes, but not when it goes against bad, basic security practice. For example, just to satisfy third-party clients, you guys kept TSA encryption, AES, CBC, uh, Cypher, and SSH1 support in your open SSH. For a long time after upstream, which is us, uh, dropped it. That's the kind of compromise that we're not willing to make. Well, that's not entirely true. Uh, Bola does not prevent them from making those changes, uh, but if they are done, they should be driven uh, in a manner so that the user are one long before. Uh, this is particularly true on a given branch. Uh, we usually make big changes between a new major release. Uh, on newer branch, they're just then removed. Well, then let me read this. According to FreeBSDS, we have revision 303716, dated August 3rd, uh, 2016. Remove DSA from default cycle list and disable SSH1. Upstream did this a long time ago, but we get DSA and SSH1 in FreeBSD for reasons which boils down to Polar. So now is a good time to catch up. Anyway, uh, <laughs> speaking about uh, delivering binary upgrades, uh, you guys must have a very hard time building the thing considering you're still using the giant lock almost everywhere, meaning you cannot use efficiently multiple cores. Well, um, for regular desktop-like usage, uh, our big lock SMP implementation model, the, the kernel lock, uh, is good enough. Uh, the reason is that most of the time on the workstation, uh, you only have a handful, uh, uh, not of course, like between two and eight, and only one socket. So our actual scheduler isn't bad, it's just that it's a bit old, to say the least, and was written for real SMP machines, meaning that it does not consider things like, for example, the cache distance, um, between cores, and that's the main reason why machines with uh, several sockets often have a lower perform performance than the ones with only one socket. There's that le less ping pong involved. So we can also use 24 cores, but uh, in the context of huge build building, for example, we have a much uh, better performance uh, concatenating the works of a six, five, four uh, cores machine for the time being. That's true. Well, how the change can be done in the free BSD, in the open BSD model? I mean, uh, on FreeBSD, it took a lot of time to get most of the architectural work done so that we can have a proper SMP, and it also led us to some of our very good releases like FreeBSD 5. <laughs> I'm not saying that the road we took uh, is the one true way, but I can't see how this can be achieved in an incremental way that is yours. Um, a few things can be uh, incremental because they're not directly related to the scheduler itself. Uh, several scheduling related issues that we have in BSD can in fact from a spin locking in LibR thread or a POSIX, uh, POSIX spin thread implementations. Uh, but that has drastically improved uh, since we implemented Futex and make our P-thread library use it. And in contrary to that, OpenBSD scales very nicely on big user and workload. Uh, now, it's raw performance on board with uh, FreeBSD. Probably not, but our priorities are different and we are okay losing a bit in this area if we can, if it gains, more, gains us more security and simplicity. Actually, I would go even further than that. I would say that we'd rather crash and panic if we detect an unsafe behavior. Well, to be honest, SMP is something that is always evolving. Um, right now, our next challenge on FreeBSD side are, are to have better number support to improve the overall locking systems uh, by using lockless mechanism where possible uh, for by using, for example, concurrency kits. Uh, what is the current status on that on OpenBSD? Uh, well, our I, uh, entire SCSI stack and kernel profiling are already fully SMB, for example. Um, and recently, there's been some huge progress on making our network stack uh, more SMB friendly. Uh, the goal of the network being able to use multiple threads to uh, forward traffic, for example. Um, I don't think you will argue that uh, modern scaling is hard. Uh, most operating systems had to do it and redo it again multiple times. We are learning from uh, other uh, OS experiments, and as usual with uh, OpenBSD, we're trying to implement something that is uh, simple and will match the uh, project goals. So, as you say, it wasn't an easy road for you. So, that explains why sometimes we may seem a bit behind in certain aspects. Uh, we take our time to do it according to our standards, or we just don't do it. So, 
while you're here, um, maybe you can explain me something uh, uh, in OpenBSD I do not understand. Uh, you seem to keep writing again and again your own tools when there are already BSD licensed counterparts. I mean, HTTPD, SMTPD, VMM, etc. Aren't you suffering some kind of NIH syndrome? Uh, that's actually a very good question. Uh, I'm glad you asked because there's actually, in my opinion, very objective reason to do that. The first one would be trust. We have a coding style, obviously, practice and process that makes us confident in what we develop. Another reason is also control. Uh, we know someone will not decide to change the, someone, the, the, the software license one day to the next or start, start adding uh, nodes for each and every crazy corner case that is out there that only two people would use, for example. So, I'm looking at how many CVEs impacted uh, NTPD uh, or OpenSSL in the last couple of years. It should be a good hint as to why OpenNTPD was created and, was, uh, and why LibreSSL was formed from OpenSSL. So if I'm not mistaken, for example, a lot of your security advisory uh, has have been related to uh, the NTP demon, including your base system, the so-called reference implementation. So I don't think it's really having an NIH syndrome uh, wanting to write secure implementations of these tools. Right. For, for the example you took, okay, I, I can understand it. Uh, but I mean, when you have already some BSD quality alternatives, um, you're still doing it. What about Beehive? It, it was working. Uh, it could be easily um, it could easily fit the security requirements about security and sandboxing. So why yet another implementation? Well, there's been an initial porting trial uh, a few years ago uh, by uh, Mike Larkin, but uh, compiling a single file ended up being a huge amount of work. So let alone run. And uh, when you're confronted with such code, you really need to ask yourself whether it's not worth just creating something from scratch instead of porting something that is not portable. The situation, I agree, may have changed since uh, now uh, OSX have, have uh, an implementation with uh, XHive. Uh, but that was one of the reasons that, uh, that uh, VNM was created. I would also uh, add that it helps us providing the base system that we want. I mean, the base system that for us just works uh, without having to depend on the choice done by the external project. Right, but another example I could have is uh, Capsicum. Uh, you decided to make your own sandboxing mechanism instead of porting that one. Oh, but there is a very good reason for that, actually. But uh, since you brought up the subject of security, let's talk about that, and we'll compare uh, sandbox implementation later on. So, um, as some of you know, most daemons run uh, with privilege separation on, uh, on OpenBSD. That is, most of the code uh, is run shrouded as, and as a, as a non-privileged user. Uh, OpenSSH uh, led the way on this topic years ago. Uh, they also use privilege replication for dropping privileges as soon as possible. Um, a good and simple example to look at uh, is NTPD again. Uh, it's a very standard OpenBSD daemon, so it's written with principle of least privilege in mind. And so not only does priv set and priv drop, but in addition to this, it has a completely privileged separated TLS speaker for the uh, constraint feature with no memory sharing or uh, FD passing uh, and with a very limited amount of uh, allowed system calls thanks to Pledge, which I will describe uh, later on. Uh, the constraint feature that I talked about uh, of uh, MTPD uh, basically queries the time from a trusted web server uh, over HTTPS, reducing the risk of a man in the middle attack by comparing that time with the one that the remote NTP server gave us. So, for NTP, well, uh, you're right, but there is one price behind that. Uh, you have a half-baked implementation. Uh, you have a, an implementation that cannot authenticate the peer you're receiving the time from, and this could be a huge problem. And you're not using the standardized mechanism in that case. Yeah, you miss half of the feature NTP is supposed to provide. And yes, I, all, I agree on the fact that most people won't care about some of those. Uh, that said, I would love that we get something out of the NTPD in the base system, but an open NTP is probably too light. But you're actually describing exactly open NTP. <laughs> I mean, it actually does not need to authenticate thanks to constraints. And it does not need to implement the kitchen sink because no one cares. And if one does, then one can install the reference implementation. I mean, it's not always about math and algorithm. And sometimes good enough really means good enough. Anyway, on a really good topic, um, OpenBSD is also well known for its uh, numerous uh, exploit mediation techniques. 
Um, it's important to note that all of these have been enabled by default for uh, some of them for years and are very hard or even impossible to disable. So just give, let me give you some, uh, a few examples. Like we, have, uh, we have ASLR to, to uh, obviously prevent the buffer on the attacks. We have a WRXOX, uh, memory page that can be either writer, uh, writable or executable in both the kernel and the user land. Uh, we have Propolis, the uh, stack, stack matching protection using uh, bounds, checking, and canary. We have uh, Pi, position uh, independent executable, uh, also for static diaries. Uh, to the executable, like a random address, which uh, stops stuff like return to libc type attacks. Uh, since not too long ago, we have a car, uh, the kernel address randomized link, which will generate a unique kernel on each boot with random uh, internal uh, structures, preventing uh, leaking internal kernel functions, pointers, or objects. And we also just got a trap set to uh, limit the availability of attacker to exploit uh, return-oriented programming like that by jumping randomly in programs. So obviously each of those techniques would round the, the ground talk, so I won't go into details uh, into them. Uh, but I want to insist on the fact that the way we approach uh, security uh, is that we always assume to be running in a hostile environment. We also refuse to implement uh, Tetris functions like the like word exp, I mean libc spawning a shell to per perform word expansions, it's like, this is completely crazy. <laughs> Um, we also provide uh, some propolis mechanism um, about ISLR. Um, we have a, an implementation which is in review right now, opening some uh, VM people to be able to review it. Um, on our side, uh, we have the MAC framework, which is a very interesting framework. It's monetary access control. It allows to restrict many, many things. So with MAC, you can restrict um, user access to system resources, including not seeing sockets opened by other users or many other stuff. Uh, you can also have a firewall-like policy on file system to be way stricter than the regular uh, file system rights. You can restrict network uh, interface accesses. Uh, you can limit the scope of the process one can see, compartmentalizing them into partition and way more things. Another interesting feature that we have is OpenBSM. It's a very full feature audit system which uh, you can use to monitor everything that happened on the system and you can distribute the log over a central server. It also supports uh, the Linux version of the uh, protocol for the centralization. Well, seeing all this technology I mentioned are, for me, uh, very interesting in theory. Uh, I do agree. But in real life, I almost never see them in action because they're too complex to use and next to impossible to, uh, to audit. Well, let's go on the sandbox part. Uh, Capsicum is a very nice sandboxing mechanism that we have on FreeBSD. It leverages the concept of capabilities. Um, what is very nice about it is uh, once you had your inside the sandbox, there is absolutely no way you can exit it. Uh, even child process inherit the capabilities. So that's by design. Uh, it is really designed for developers to secure their own application by uh, strictly restricting uh, the capability of an application to only what it really needs to be able to and strictly what it is uh, really needs to be able to do. To do. Uh, we have started converting most of the base system to use it. We're not entirely there yet because, yes, the design of Capsicum allows no compromise, so uh, it's not always that easy to convert existing software to Capsicum. Yeah, that's where I wanted to go, actually. Uh, it's saying that Capsicum, it's too complicated. That's why it doesn't no. get much use by default. Uh, the Plexi score is actually very good, a very good summary of what OpenBSD project is about. Develop practical and affordable security, meaning simple and easy to implement and hence enabled by default almost everywhere in the system. I mean, 30% of the base system was pledged after only two months. Today it's more like 85 to 90%, I don't have the exact number, but, uh, and even some monster ports like Chromium uh, are pledged. So, anyway. Um, talking about pledge uh, itself, uh, for us, it, um, it's designed to serve two goals, basically. Encourage refactoring towards safer model and reduce code exposure to the kernel. So people often compare it to a SecCom BPF on Linux, although Pledge is not a system called Spiral, uh, but rather uh, somewhat like a, a facility to explicitly allow a group of system calls uh, in the form of 
process uh, with some sort of pre-care profiles like INET, shown DNS, TTY. And obviously a patch process is forced into a restrictive service operating mode uh, where abilities can be reduced but never regained. And if a restricted operation is attempted, then the process is killed with an uncatchable CD board. In theory, I agree that capability-based uh, security may be more advanced, and it probably is, but what would is a feature that is too complex to be widely implemented? Another security feature that we do have on FreeBSD, and we have it for a while, um, is Gel. Um, it allows to create prison container. Um, we have it on FreeBSD since FreeBSD 4, I guess, if I remember correctly. Um, it's very simple and easy to use. Uh, almost everything can be disabled and is disabled by default, or, res or can be restricted inside the jail, so you can restrict uh, network, file system access, CPU, memory, uh, routing table, and nowadays it can even be nested, you can have their own DataFS dataset dedicated or have virtual network. Well, uh, in that regard, I do agree that uh, we suck. Um, OpenBSD has no container-like technology. Uh, there's been an initial report years ago called uh, SysGel, but it was abandoned because of an inherent design issue in SysTrace on which the tool was based, and that would basically allow fading gel by uh, exploiting race conditions. So. But anyway, uh, getting tired, so I think it's time to move to something else and go break. Yeah. Let's do that. Thank you and see you after the break.